thank you, Anna. No pressure at all. Thank you. For the, <laughs> thank you for the lovely introduction. And I was just looking down the names. I, I was looking at all the uh, different participants, and I, I recognise lots of names. So unless people have got doubles in the world, I think there are a lot of people on the on the call that I'm familiar with, which is really really nice. So it's nice to see everyone. Nice to welcome everyone. And um, yeah, I look forward to get starting. So um, if it's sorry, okay, Catherine, I'm going to need to interrupt you. Sorry, I forgot to say to everybody, if they could. Um, put themselves on mute if they're not and if they have anything they want to ask any questions if they could put it in the chat and um, then we'll look at it throughout the program um, as Catherine so if you could save a lot all your questions really for the chat and then Catherine will pick them up throughout the, um, the session thanks Thank you. OK, good stuff. So so we'll get started, if that's OK. And just a, a techie request, if it's possible, looks like you're all on mute. Not, not that I don't want to hear your lovely voices, um, but, but it's easier for management. But if you've got your camera on, if you could also turn your camera off, um, we'd be really grateful just because it helps with the bandwidth um, for the delivery. Anyway, it's lovely to be with you. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully uh, you'll be able to see it. Anna, you'll just have to give me a cue to make sure you can see it. Yeah, I'll let you know in a minute. Yep. Okay, good stuff. Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. All right, so welcome to Coaching Teams for the Future, and it's lovely to have been invited by CIPD to come and talk to you. I think this might be the fourth time. Oh, a little voice. Oh, oh, could everybody put yourself on mute, please? There we go. Thank there we you. go. Always technical hitches, aren't there? Um, so yes, yeah, so I think it's about the fourth time that I've come to talk to CIPD, and it's always it's always a pleasure, um, particularly to talk to people from the the southeast because that's from where I'm from, and uh, often, as I said earlier, I find familiar people pop up. So it's nice to to see everyone I know and uh, people that I don't. Welcome. It's lovely to be with you. So. Perhaps let's start off with where are you in the world? Because I was noticing that there were some people from quite far flung places. So perhaps if I could start by asking you just to pop into the chat where you are in the world so we get a sense of, of where people are. Wow, Slovakia. With <laughs> me. Okay. Wow, Bromley, Bexley, Essex. I know these places. Croydon, definitely know that. Greece, goodness me. Wow. We are a diverse population. United States, Florida, welcome. Fabulous. Gosh, really diverse. So wherever you are in the world, welcome. It's really lovely to be with you. Um, and, and as Anna said, if you could wait until the uh, end to do questions or if you have questions, pop them into the chat and we'll have some stopping points and, and I'll try and answer those questions for you. Well, look, someone's put that they're a Hampton Court. Now I've got an image of someone living in Hampton Court. That sounds really posh. Anyway, let me let me tell you a bit about myself. And I always think this is a really um, uncomfortable part of any presentation talking about yourself. But perhaps just for a moment, let me tell you my background and, and how I ended up here and talking to you at CIPD. So um, my background is originally I trained in psychology um, and I spent uh, four or five years working in the retail industry, helping leaders come into the business. Um, and I had this kind of life epiphany that it's really hard to talk to people about leadership if you've never actually been a leader yourself. Um, and in a strange moment and twist of fate, I decided to kind of report my life and I trained to be a teacher um, and I became a head and executive head and then worked in a multi academy trust um, and the charity sector across the southeast. Um, and I loved it. It was an absolute passion. Um, have always coached and been a coach. Um, and uh, I guess maybe after 10 years of working as a head and working in a multi academy trust, um, I decided that I wanted to go back to my psychology roots and I opened uh, KPNA. Um, and Really, it's a, it's a company that works with all kinds of different walks of life. Um, and I have a team now of, of four people that work with me, all coaches, team coaches, people who are expert in their fields in leadership. So what we offer is leadership consultancy and facilitation. We do training, we do workshops, organisational development, uh, diagnostics, things like MBTI and insights and other, I have other diagnostic tools. Um, I also work as a, an action learning facilitator and trainer. I'm an EMCC senior practitioner executive coach. And of course, I'm here today in my capacity 
as a team coach. So it's lovely to meet you and lovely to be with you. Um, and here are my contact details. So often people poke me at the end because I've forgotten to do that. So in case that's interesting to you, these are my details. You can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on Twitter, you can find my website. Um, and I love to talk to people about coaching and leadership. So if you want to have a virtual coffee and get in touch and learn more and have a chat, then please do drop me an email. I'd be happy to talk to you. So let me talk to you about my team coaching journey, really. I guess it's been a sort of lifelong passion indirectly and directly. Um, I've always been people curious. My mum tells these terrible stories. Actually, mostly they come out like your 18th and your 21st birthday parties. But she tells these two terrible stories of me as a little one. She says, as a baby, I was really nosy. So as a baby, I would sit in my pram and stare at people. And um, she said it was really embarrassing because she'd have to explain why I, why I was staring. But the way she put it was that I was just interested in what was going on around me. Um, and, then, and then when I was about two or three and could walk, she'd taken me into the post office and somehow I'd managed uh, she'll hate me for telling you this. Somehow I'd managed to take myself off on a little jaunt around the post office and found myself standing in the middle of an argument between a couple. And she said they hadn't really noticed I was there. And all you could see was my head going backwards and forwards as I was watching the dynamics of what was going on. So I guess I've always been people curious. I guess I've always been team curious. Um, and I guess team curious because... I've been in teams, I've led teams, good teams, terrible teams and everything in the middle. Um, and I've observed a lot of teams. So um, in the work that we do now at KPNA, we spend probably about 50% of our time working in the, in the public sector. So we work um, in education, in the civil service, um, work with charities, uh, and then about 50% of our time working with commercial business. So we do work with people like Sky, um, Paper UK, CPRE, um, some fairly big kind of commercial corporate organisations, and it's really interesting work. Um, and then, of course, on came action learning and this leadership consultancy and facilitation and the one to one coaching. And I guess what puzzled me a bit was as much as I love that work and I do, I always had this sense that you could affect the individual, but you could only affect the individual and hope that they affect, affected the wider system. And what I was seeing more and more is that people would be coming in and being really frustrated in coaching or one to one work about the wider system and trying their bit in trying to change it, but not actually having the significant impact that they wanted to have. Um, probably the best example I could give you would be a couple of years ago, I worked with the chief exec of a bank and um, We'd always met in actually in a hotel, um, you know, his choice of venue, sitting, having coffee, doing some coaching work. And, and for, for one particular reason, which I can't recall, uh, for this particular session, I said, oh, why don't we go into your office? It might be useful to do this piece of work in your office. And so we arrived at this huge building with 147 floors and this chief exec had their office right at the top of the penthouse and we got in the lift. And we typed in 147 and went up to the top. And um, we'd been talking a lot about this person's team and the frustrations around the team's performance. And so as we're going up in the lift, I turned around and I said, oh, talk to me about your team. You know, what, what are they like? They're on many levels. So tell me what they're like. And, and the answer I got was, I don't know. I've never been on any level other than 147. And I guess I found that really curious. So there's something about connections and teams that relates to performance. And then I guess another iteration, working in workshops and delivering kind of messages about teams and then getting the person who's commissioned you asking, well, what do you think about my team? And, and really engaging in those honest conversations, which then led for me to a certificate in team coaching with the AOEC, which was an absolutely brilliant brilliant experience so I'd recommend that if you're looking for some team coaching training so what are we doing today so today we're exploring what makes a good team so I think we've got about an hour an hour and a half to think about what makes a good team um, we're thinking about issues that occur for teams certainly exploring what team coaching is and what it isn't 
and how it might help. And I want to try and give you some frameworks that I like to use and some diagnostics that I like to use that might help you either because you're curious about it and you want to know more or because you're working in that field and, and you know you want a different lens or a different perspective on that work. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about what happens in the process of change and I'll try along the way to share my stories. I'll try and share the good ones, the bad ones and everything in the middle. Um, I've certainly made lots of mistakes as a team coach and, and, and some good things too. So I'll try and share those as we go. So shall we pause for a minute and do you want to pop into the chat? What matters to you? What are you most interested in when we talk about teams? And I'll try and make sure I answer as many of those things as I can. So what are you most interested about when we talk about teams or team coaching? Do you want to just pop that into the chat? OK, lovely engagement. How do you find out what makes individuals tick? Mm, interesting question. We're definitely going to answer that. Yeah. What happens in conflict? How do you deal with it constructively? Lovely. Yeah. Team dynamics. Sharing ideas. Gosh, engagement and conflict comes up a lot. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So hopefully I'll try and answer some of those questions. And if I don't, then ask the question directly and I'll try and answer it in the best way I can for you. OK, so let's talk about teams. So I love this description from Yakul. So Yakul says, the word team is correctly used to describe an interacting group that has members with a common purpose, independent roles and complementary skills. I think that's a really interesting definition of teams, because when we talk about teams, most commonly we get stuck on talking about team performance. I mean, how many times have you heard someone use the phrase high performance teams? What makes a high performance team? And yet when we look at that definition by Yakul, it's got nothing to do with high performance. What he's talking about is how the team interact and their purpose and their roles and their complementary skills and how that all comes together. So for me, when we're talking about performance, I'm less interested in that because I see that as a symptom of something else. I see that as something that comes out of something else. For me, the cause in success of a team is really about connection and what happens within the team and around the team to make them exceptional, the byproduct being their exceptional performance. And Mike Robbins talks a bit about this. Um, he says that performance is 20% of what teams are about and connection within the team and around the team is actually 80% of what really matters. Um, and I think back maybe a year or so ago, I was working with a, with a multi-academy trust, and I should probably tell you I've been given permission to share these examples. So I was, walk, I was working with a multi-academy tr uh, multi trust um, who had brought me in because they felt they had a culture issue. So their frustration, the executive team's frustration really was that they wanted this family feel across all of their schools, yet what they felt was happening was that individual head teachers were guarding their school as opposed to seeing themselves as being part of a bigger culture or a bigger body. And they wanted to try and kind of understand how do we how do we how do we change this? What do we need to do? What do they need to do? And then this beautiful moment came up with she fix X said the problem with them is. And I think everybody stopped at that moment because what they realized was. The answer was in that phrase, because what he described was a them and us culture. The problem with them is. And so we were able to have a conversation and to do some thinking and some coaching around. Actually, we have to exemplify the team. The executive team has to be as connected to the wider team for us to be an us and not an us and them. So there's something about the connections, the systems, the way that we work together that makes team performance exceptional. So what makes a terrible team? Well, I guess there's lots of rhetoric about this and lots of personal experience and lots of stuff in the press. I'm sure you could share a hundred different things, but you know, what makes a terrible team? So perhaps if in the chat, do you want to pop in maybe a word or two about what you think makes a terrible team? Any kind of aspects or things, anything from your own experience, what would you say? Give me some adjectives to describe what you think constitutes a terrible team. Oh, nice, bad leadership. Yeah, toxic behaviour. 
yeah, gossip, disrespectful relationships, selfishness, politicking. Oh, I love that. One upmanship, nice, working in silos, yeah, lack of working together, lack of dynamics. Yeah, fab. All right. So, so what you guys are bringing out is there's something about connection. There is something about connection. So look, what makes a terrible team? We could probably debate this till the cows come home. We can probably think of a hundred examples of, of bad teams and, 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 and everything in between. And I guess there's some really kind of seminal works around this. So you'll all probably be familiar with Lencioni and his works on the five dysfunctions of the team. And he simply says, right, dysfunctional teams have an absence of trust, a fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and therefore inattention to results. But you know, the funny thing is we can, we can kind of see this and feel it and smell it. So um, Amy Edmondson, as you probably have heard of, she, she describes this as psychological safety. So she says, what makes a terrible team is a team that isn't psychologically safe. It's a team that can't be vulnerable with each other. They can't be honest. They can't, you know, they're, they're not connecting correctly. It's toxic. They've got different agendas. They don't take responsibility and accountability. They can't have those conversations. You know, and we see this stuff play out in history. So um, Wyke talks about, and this is a horrible example, so forgive me, but it really sticks in my head. Wyke talks about the Tenerife disaster. Um, and what he says is on March the 27th, 1977, the KLM flight 4805 crashed on its journey uh, from Amsterdam to Tenerife. And sadly, there were 523 people on board and they didn't survive. Now, what happened was they retrieved the black box of the flight recorder. And for some reason, there seemed to be some audio recording in some kind of the, in some of the tech. And what they heard was a conversation go on between two air stewards, one who said, have you noticed the liquid coming out of the engine on that side? The other one said, oh, yeah, I had noticed, but don't bother the captain. You know, they're on it. Let's 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 not worry about it. We trust them. And what Wyke says, it's a, it's an absolutely awful but brilliant, brilliant example of where psychological safety goes wrong. So because we don't feel that we can say something, the critical information that the other person can see doesn't get shared in the team and then bad things happen. So a horrible example, but it sticks in my, it sticks in my brain around what works in teams and what doesn't. So let's think about what makes a great team. And, and this has been much harder to settle on over time. And there's enormous, there's still enormous debate about what makes a great team. And I'm sure you will have personal opinions about what makes a great team. But I guess when we're thinking about it in the context of team coaching, what we're trying to understand as a team coach is three different levels, three different kind of areas around what makes a great team. So the first is we've got to understand what the client thinks a great team is, either because it's going to be accurate or because it will help us to understand where the gaps are. The second thing is we're going to bring in our perspective around that as a coach. So not about imparting our judgment about what makes a great team, but understanding the core elements that make up a great team so that we can analyze any blind spots, we can work out where stuff is missing, um, and we can help a bit like Joe Hari's window, if you're familiar with that, we can help people to, to really identify what they might need to be doing or what they can't see. And the last bit is, and I think this often gets big, forgotten, when we're thinking about what makes a great team, we need to work out what the stakeholders think is a great team. So if we think about that in commercial or corporate business, we're talking about the board or we might be talking about customers or we might be talking about other business partners. When we're working in education, we're going to be talking about the children and the parents and the community. You know, when we're working in charities, we're going to be talking about our fundraisers. We're going to be talking about the recipients of that stuff. And actually their perspective of the team is incredibly important. So let's pause for a minute and perhaps you can pop in the chat because it's all looking a bit negative now because we've got what makes a terrible team. So let's let's have your views on what do you think the aspects of the team are? If you could give me one top thing, what would that be? Just chuck it in the chat for me.
diverse. I like that. Yeah, good communication, lovely, shared purpose, trust. Yeah, fab. Okay, some lovely ideas coming through. All right, so let's let's have a think about, oh, got some more. Aligned, responsibility, respect, yeah, accountability and authenticity, knowledge sharing, yeah, lovely. Okay, some really great things there. Again, about connection, and, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So let's have a look at dimensions of effective teams. So again, there's, there's some early work around dimensions of effective teams, and I guess we could argue um, that it's about who we have in the team. So if you look at the work of Belbin, uh, and you know, I think this is important work, but if you look at the work of Belbin, Belbin talks about the different roles within a team that make up a team. So someone in the chat's put diversity. So Belbin's very much saying we need a diverse set of people in a team to make it agile enough that we're, that we're not missing anything. Um, Adair does a similar thing. He talks, he actually worked at Sandhurst. So he looked at what makes an army officer um, effective team member and he talks very much about that individual being a core part of both the team and the task and I think if you um, I'm sure you're familiar with these but if you think about model, modern commercial thinking and um, diversity and the importance of different types of people in teams is definitely showing up as important and Hefferman talks about this a lot so she says um, if we think about the British army uh, no, this might be a strange example, because if I was going to ask you about diversity and agility, you probably wouldn't necessarily come up straight away with the British Army, or maybe you would. But the British Army have done a huge piece of work on this. So um, they, they realise that if they look back historically, their way of leadership has been about compliance. So it's a high compliance, well, it has been a high compliance model. And what their research is beginning to show is, is actually diversity in thinking and diversity in style in the army is actually very important because if we think about soldiers on a battlefield how likely is every situation going to be covered by a policy or a piece of training it's going to be fairly unlikely so to be successful in sadly warfare we actually need people who in the moment can be diverse in their thinking in the team in order to help find a solution and Netflix and um, Patty McCord talks a lot about this, that they they absolutely recruit on diversity, diversity in thinking. So they say that you should hug the most irritating person in your team. What I'm saying there is you should hug the person who has the opposite view to you because that person will stretch your perspective and make you think differently and stop you from missing something core. Cool. So they actively look for that psychological safety and having those conversations when, when they're building great teams. So I think that's a really lovely way of thinking. So now let's bring that into the whole team dimension because it's not just who we have in, in a team. And I think there's this lovely phrase that sticks in my head, which is five brilliant individuals does not a team make. So if you have five fabulous, independently brilliant chief executives and you bung them in a team, it doesn't mean that the team's going to be kind of high performing or high output. You know, it, it's got something else about it. So Wageman and Hackman came up with this and they talk about the connections between the components of the team and also the synergy between the internal factors or the internal setup of the team and the external setup of the team. Um, so they talk about the six conditions for really effective team leadership. So the first is, as we talked about, the right people. OK, so we've got to have the right people on board and they've got to be diverse enough in order to stretch that thinking. The second bit is the team have to know who's in the team. Now, that might seem like a little bit of an irony, but quite often within teams, there are cliques that form. And so you end up with micro teams within the bigger team. And what Wageman and Hackman say is actually the team collectively have to admit that they are a team. And from that, they have to have a compelling direction, a compelling purpose, a compelling mission that they share. And then outside of them, they need a supportive context. They need structures around them that are going to help them communicate and work effectively together. I'm, I'm sorry, and, I'm and of course, they're also going to need, oh, you've got a little voice. Hello, everybody. Could you go on <laughs> mute yourselves, please? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> 
Um, and of course, uh, they put in team coaching because they're passionate about it. But you should have someone that helps you to see what you may not be able to see. And uh, Hawkins and Clutterbuck and Yucca will take this a little bit. This is kind of worth keeping in your head if you're working in the field of team coaching, because it's these things that we're trying to assess in terms of where teams are. So they say the most effective teams internally have really diverse skills and everybody understands their role clearly. And when we say role, they understand their role as a team member, but they also understand their independent roles, their individual roles within that. They have, they have a vision and a measurable mission, and they're really clear on what they're heading towards in the next year, in the next three years, in the next five years. They can articulate it. It comes out of their skin. They, they know exactly what it is. They've built systems and processes for communication and accountability with each other and also down for those that they lead. Um, they have a good feel about them, so they're cooperative, they trust each other, they have a collective sense of efficacy and potency, they have that kind of synergy, um, and as, I've said, as I said a moment ago, member diversity. And then outside of the team, they connect to who they're serving and they really understand the expectations of those people, so they don't shut themselves away, they ask. Um, Daniel Coyle in his book, The Culture Code, talks about it talks about it as the bouncing boomerang. So they're forever coming back and saying, tell us what you see, tell us what you need, tell us if we're meeting your expectations. Of course, they need resources and they need political support. So whether that's the board supports them, whether that's kind of stuff in their wider external world that's supporting them, um, and they're outwardly coordinated. So they have systems and processes for working with other people outside of the individual team. And what this gives, what this gives is systemic connection. Hello, um, sorry, there's somebody. I need to mute him. Sorry, I'm going to have to look. I'll have a look in the chat to see who's not muted himself. That's all right. No worries. I've muted everyone, so hopefully we're we're okay. Uh, and what that gives is this kind of sense of systemic connection. So it's holding on to the fact that actually what what is what really matters in a team is not all the individuals and how they work but how they connect together, how all those connections really work and how agile they are. And that is what turns itself into performance. And I love this piece of research by um, HBR. So they did this, I don't know how they got anybody to agree to this, but they did this amazing piece of research where they put electronic badges on, on what on paper were, are considered the most successful teams in the world. And they stuck electronic badges on them for a period of something like intermittent uh, an intermittent period of about 12 weeks because they wanted to know how these people operated. Um, I'm, all I keep thinking is I hope they took them off when they went to the toilet because that would just be absolutely awful. But anyway, this is what they found out. They found out that in the most successful teams, people talk and listen in equal measure. They face one another when they're talking and their gestures are energetic. They connect to one another and not just the team leader. So they have kind of cross connection and, and to the leader. Um, they carry on team conversation outside of the team. So they talk as a team and they talk as a team outside of the team arena. And occasionally they break away from the team to connect with people that aren't part of the team and they come back again. So there's this real sense that the best teams have energy, they have engagement, and they have this sense of kind of exploration around really connecting with others and understanding where people outside of the team see them. And I love that. Uh, so where do we see that? I, I guess you could probably give me 100 examples of where you might have seen this, but here are some of my kind of Current favorite examples, the All Blacks will always stay with me as a really good example of a team that has great connection, 80%, if not more, and that performance. So they've got that connection piece just right because it results in performance. And we see that, that connection in the hucker. Um, and I think most recently, certainly in the pandemic, although we don't coach them and I don't know what's going on inside uh, this particular team, but we might say that the New Zealand government are doing a really fabulous job of team connectivity and, and, and team performance. 
they certainly have diversity, they certainly are getting outcomes, there certainly seems to be harmony, they seem to be authentic with one another. Um, and, and I've got Boris and Dominic Cummings, probably not because I think they're an, ex an exceptional example of team connection, but I'll let you, uh, let you make your own decisions about that. Um, and of course, we're working virtually, aren't we? Um, many of us are still working virtually. And, uh, you know, if you think about connection there, I bet you've learned some lessons about connectivity and how, how really to stay connected to your team when you're working virtually. And Lynn and Standing and Lou did a lovely piece of work where they found out that actually when we're working virtually, um, whether you're an international team working virtually or you're, you're a team that's had to because of the pandemic, this stuff about relationships, connectivity, honesty becomes so incredibly important. So they found that successful, successful virtual working is founded on communication, relationship building, great systemic coordination and cohesion, even when people aren't physically together. And that leads to great performance and ultimately great satisfaction. So I guess I'm interested from your point of view, if you've been working virtually, perhaps you can pop into the chat. Have you learned any lessons about how to stay connected to your team? Perhaps if you want to pop it into the chat, any lessons you've learned about how to stay connected to your team? And while you're typing in, I, I had a, I saw a great one on Facebook this week of um, it's actually a banking team who have a Facebook group and every Friday they, they have a fancy dress team call, which I thought was quite an interesting way to stay to stay connected. Yeah, I love that. So Sue says, phone your colleagues, yeah, for a chat, casual catch ups online, make time for non work connection. Yeah team agreeing on how they all use different channels and how they're available. Yeah, I love that. I'm sure we've learned 100 different ways to stay connected when we can't physically be together. Anyway, why does it matter? Why does it matter that teams are fantastic? And I guess, gosh, there's again 100 different answers to that. But these are the four that I like. Um, and I guess the, the main one is because we live in a volatile, unpredictable, complex and ambiguous, ambiguous world. Um, you know, as if as if we couldn't describe it better, um, the pandemic the pandemic has served to completely shock us, um, change our everything, turn us upside down. It certainly has been volatile, unpredictable, complex, and ambiguous, and continues to be so. Um, so we have to have teams that can deal with that. And also, I think uh, you know, recruitment. If I think back, maybe thirty years ago, to recruitment. It was a very different game applying for a job to how it is now. Now, graduates are going into jobs where even at the lowest paid job, they want the most supreme person. And adverts say that you have to be all of these things in order to be considered. So people and teams need to be really agile. And I love this phrase. I think this phrase comes from Peter Hawking. He says, teams are a living organism. And they have to be able to respond as such because not only do they change because people come and go, but also they have to be able to respond to the, the world that we're living in and, and the pace of change that, that we're experiencing. So it matters, it matters enormously because we want high performance, but we also want capability that drives that. And I think the days of the godlike leader who was the hero that came in and fixed everything and led the team and made it what they wanted it to be have probably gone. I think the days of the maybe the 90s where that was a thing are gone now. And now we realize the importance of that team connection. So for me, where does team coaching turn up? Well, it turns up because either an outsider to the team comes along and says, I've got a problem with this team's performance and it's frustrating me. So that might be a board member. Um, it might be, I don't know, an authoritative body that's assessed the organization and, and is recommending that, that they get some support. Or it comes from the team themselves because they say we're frustrated and we don't know why. And it's not, our work isn't turning out what we expect it to turn out. Um, and for me, my personal experience is often what happens is I might be coaching a, a chief exec or a leader of an organization in a one-to-one -one capacity, and we might begin to notice that there is this team frustration 
and that might lend itself to some some teamwork or it might be that someone reaches out or or it comes out of other things like facilitation or workshops so i think most recently i was working with a local authority and they were doing some some work around leadership and actually through the activities their their discussion brought out that really there was a piece of work to do around culture and around team and that lent itself to some team coaching so for me why do teams get stuck um, they get stuck because of leadership of the team. I think some of you have put that in the chat. Certainly leadership is definitely a, a factor. Um, they get stuck because they get stuck in old stories. King of transactional analysis says that teams have scripts. They have scripts that were formulated a long time ago, perhaps even before the current members of the team belong to the team. And teams live out that old story. So they live out those old habits, they live out those ways of being. And what happens is performance becomes downgraded. It might be because of change and disruption. It might be because they've become disconnected from their stakeholders and they've lost a sense of what it is that they need to be doing. Or, and this is the most common one that I experience, it might be because within the team, there's a pattern of blame. So it might be that we can't move forward because we're all too busy pointing fingers at each other and saying it's your fault. So it can emerge for lots of different reasons. And really, the art of the job is about unpicking that stuff. So cue the team coach, most amazing job in the world. So what is it? Um, and, and again, this is from uh, Hawkins and Clutterbuck. If you haven't seen their work, I would highly recommend it. Um, they have both written numerous books around team coaching and continue to do lots of webinars and talks and discussion around it. And it's really fascinating stuff. Um, but they say, look, it's about partnering with an entire team in an ongoing relationship, right? Ongoing relationship, partnering with the entire team for the purpose of collectively raising awareness and building better connections in the team's internal and external systems and enhancing the team's capability to cope with current and future challenges. So what I take away from that is we're building their long-term capacity. We're empowering them to own the stuff we're doing. So we're not coming in as the expert to tell them what to do. We're not coming in to um, fix the problem. What we're doing is we're empowering them to fix the problem so that they become sustainable. So it's that sense of co-creation. We're working in partnership with them to build those systemic connections. I think that's a really good example of, of what it is really. So what is it not? Um, and these are Clutterbox views, but, but I echo this really. Um, it's not coaching individuals. So my job as a team coach is not to come in and individually coach the components of the team to make them better. That won't work. Because when I'm coaching a team, I'm coaching the gaps between them. I'm coaching the connection, connections that make them better rather than who they are individually. It certainly isn't working with only part of the team. So that piece around knowing who the whole team are. So if, if you think about the example of the multi-academy trust I use, actually the team that they really wanted to connect with was not just the executive team, they wanted to connect with the head teachers too. And actually that was the team arena that they were working in. It's not about teaching someone else to coach the team. Um, and you don't come with a magical wand to be able to do that. It's not team building or away days or um, going out in the woods and running around. Um, it's not facilitation. It certainly isn't training and consultancy and it's definitely not a fixed methodology. So although I'm going to talk to you about the way that I team coach, it comes with the caveat of every time I meet a different team, I do a slightly different iteration of what I'm doing based on what they need and how I think they work. But I definitely want to give you a couple of health warnings. Um, and these are, are kind of self-learning health warnings. So the first is I have learnt that it is never a great thing to be coaching the chief exec or the leader of the team whilst you're working with the team. And for me, that's about trust. Because when I'm working with the team, I want them to understand two things. I want them to understand that I'm partnering with them to help them to find answers. But that actually I'm there to serve their stakeholders. And that is really my client. So my client 
is the stakeholder who's going to be the end recipient of the excellent work that this team are going to do. When I coach the chief exec or I coach the senior leader in the team, what happens is the dynamic shift because although I can preach confidentiality, they're never quite sure because they've got no proof whether that's the case or not. Second thing, obvious thing, rescuing, and it's a massive temptation. And I, uh, I think because of my own walk of life, um, that comes kind of naturally really, but my job isn't to give answers. So, so my job is to facilitate their thinking, not to jump in and give the answer. And I think if you've worked in leadership development or organizational development, or you've been a leader yourself, you have answers and thoughts about ways, the way stuff can be done. But your job isn't to share that. Your job is to facilitate the thinking. And as I said, the last bit is remember what you're in service to. So I am always in service to the next generation of stakeholders. So if I think about working with schools, um, I'm really serving the children's children for the future. If I'm working in business, I'm thinking about the clients, but I'm also thinking about the next generation of clients and what they're going to need. And for me, that's incredibly important to keep at the heart of what I'm doing. So some core principles, and I've taken these from Peter Hawkins because I love them. I think they're, they're just lovely things to remember when you're team coaching. So the aim is always to be doubly effective in half the time. So when I'm working with the team, I'm trying to get them to be doubly effective in half the time, whether that's in their discussion, whether that's in the work they do. I want them to be twice as fast and you know as doubly effective as they were before i'm always going to focus on the connections not the individuals so i look for language so i look for things like whether they use the word you or whether they use we and i pick that stuff up so i often might say right we're taking a time out what's happening here and we spend a moment just reflecting on what we're seeing and what we're hearing and what the dynamics are I've said this one, we're in service of the stakeholder and the generations afterwards. Oh, I love this one. Um, reframe the problem to the next challenge and solution. Don't get locked in blame or the past. So one of the, the beginning parts of team coaching is you unpick what the challenges are. And what people tend to do, because we're all human, is we talk about what happened in the past and the problem that it causes and why it's a problem today. So when I'm working with teams, I often reframe their language and I say things like, I can hear what you're saying. So what you're telling me is the next challenge to be solved by this team is rather than focusing on the problem that's gone. Where they start to blame each other, because that does happen as, as things get sticky and difficult in the conversation you're having. I often stop the conversation and I say, what's happening here? OK, let's get back to thinking about the next challenge and how we can support each other in that challenge. And that language is incredibly important. OK, I try to attend to the work and the team process rather than anything else that might be going on. So politicking came up as something in the chat. I don't get into that. I would just stop the team and say, what's happening here? Is this useful? OK, let's get back to the work. Let's get back to the process of the next challenge. I partner with the team. So I'm partners in helping them to do their thinking. Never know better never know first. So I'm going to try never to know better and never to know first. So if I'm successful in the work that I'm doing with the team, what I think is when we're working in sessions, we'll be on the learning edge. So what will come out of the sessions is are things that none of us ever knew were going to happen before we walked into the room. I want to empower them. So I want to get to a point where I'm completely redundant because they are empowered and can do stuff themselves. And I think I said this at the beginning, but outside in and future first. So when we're thinking about what we're doing and then making decisions, I'm going to be asking them questions around, is that what people external to you are expecting? And how does this serve the future? How does it serve one year, three year, five years? So for me, they're, they're re really, really critical key principles and I hope they, they resonate with you. Right, I'm going to pause for breath. I have just witted at you for about 40 minutes, so I do apologise. Time for questions, and then we'll talk about the process itself. So a couple of seconds, any questions, if you want to pop them into the chat, and I will try and answer them for you. I'll give you a moment to do that. 
Oh, it's a nice comment from Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. OK, so Camilla says, can you tell us an example of how you empower a senior leader or a CEO? What did you actually tell them and how did you do it? Well, that's a really that's a really difficult question to answer. I love that. Um, OK, so thinking about how you empower a CEO, well, I guess I guess partly the answer to that, I just flip my screen back on, is understanding the context in which we're working with them. So if it's in one to one coaching, then the answer to that is we're working through questions and we're working through observations and reflections and perspective stretching to help someone to commit to actions. In the context of the team, the job isn't about the CEO. The job is about how the team work together. So quite often when I'm working with uh, chief execs in a team, what happens is there's a power dynamic where they try to answer everything. So actually what I'm doing in team coaching is I'm making sure that everybody has a voice and ev there's equity in that voice and there's equity in that voice coming up with some answers and some solutions. So I think that's a really useful question to ask because I think the answer to that for me is, is not that I'm working with the CEO to empower them, but, but that I'm working with the team. I hope that answered the question. If it didn't, then please do, do poke me a bit more. OK, so a couple of other questions. I'll try and pick these up. Paul okay. says, where do you see team coaching in the next three? Oh, go on, Anna. Oh, sorry, Catherine. Can I tell you the one that came after that one? Yeah, do, the one that it. came after the question you answered was, what's the best way to deal with resistance? Oh, that's a brilliant question. Um, so I'll give you my experience, but you people may have other techniques. So my way of uh, dealing with resistance is to stop the session and ask what's going on here. And, it, and normally what happens is, is it creates a rupture, what I would call a rupture. Um, and you normally see people sit back a bit. And I say, I'm noticing there's, there's some tension here. Can we explore what that tension is about? So, so what I'm doing is I'm trying to bring into awareness the process, the kind of psychological process, the relationship process that's going on within the team. So what happens there usually is that person then explains how they're feeling and I try and reframe that into a challenge. So what I say is what you're telling me is the next challenge for this team is that everyone in this team needs to have a sense of value. Thank you for sharing that with me. How do we do that team? How do we work together? Who can jump into this conversation and help me help us to find a way that we can do that? So acknowledge it. Ask for a response to it. And then reframe it into the next challenge and ask the team to solve that. And that for me twists it into a positive, proactive way. Does that answer the question, Anna? Um, yeah, that sounds good to me, but I wonder um, uh, the person who asked it, if that, if they could just pop in the chat if that did um, answer for them. Um, somebody, I, somebody wanted to know if you could give a, a small demonstration of team coaching. I don't know if you want to do, try that at the end or? <laughs> well that is nothing like being put on the spot um the answer to that probably is team coaching takes about two hours that's kind of a bare minimum of a session and you have to have a real team to be able to do that or at least a simulated pretending team to be able to do that so rather than do that on this session i wonder if anna maybe i could come back and do that as a fishbowl exercise yeah. with the ipd in another yeah. session yeah, that sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. I'd love to do that. And perhaps some people could volunteer to be the team and I could give them a brief about their roles in that team. Oh, yeah, that sounds yeah. good. I'd, I'd volunteer myself. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, and, and then I don't know if you want one more question before you continue. Yeah, There's one more another question. Another one said, how would you re-energise a tired team? Oh, that's interesting. I wonder what the context is for that. Perhaps if you want to, if whoever wrote that question, it's a great question. You, if you want to put some context in, then please do. Um, Re-energising in a session, if it's in a session, whew, I would normally, I guess, get the team to take a break. Frida, was that your question? Yes. Hi. Hey, do you want to give some context? <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, um, Kind of, I'm, I'm dealing with, with with a team that's gone through quite a lot of uh, um, stressful moments, mm. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and they they've done their best to 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 bounce back, but every time they bounce back, there's always something coming coming kind of from outside. Actually, it's not it's, the, the teamwork goes pretty well, but they they've really really deflated, and and. I'm, I'm trying to be my best at kind of cheering up and, but sometimes it's, it just doesn't work. So, so I was thinking, how can I, can I, maybe I need to transform something within me and then they're going to transform, but it's, yeah, probably it, it works fine, but how, how can you cope with a team that has really, it's, it's been, it's been uh, tested by, by external environment or from something they actually, they, 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 they're not uh, the, the origin of. Yeah, that's, that's a really great um, scenario. I think for me, there are probably two answers without knowing the full context. Um, the first one is, and I'll refer to this later on, it might just be where the, the stage of, let me get my teeth in, it might just be the stage of development that the team are in. So I'm thinking about Bruce Tuckman's model of change and thinking about his pit of despair, which, excuse my language, I sometimes call the shit pit because it's where the bad stuff happens. But but teams can go through that dip. So part of it might just be understanding that as they go through that transformation, they have to go through that dip. And it might be about accepting that that dip has to occur. And it's nothing to do with you. It, it, it's a natural part of change. Um, the second thing is, is to talk to the team about it, because I think as a team leader or someone in HR or an external person, we can get that sense of wanting to rescue them or try and fix it. And actually, if you change that into the belief that they have the power to fix it, if we can just understand what the challenge is, then they can find the solution. And I think what happens there is you stop yourself from getting into what I would call drama triangle, where you've got rescuer and victim and it never quite plays out the way you want it to play. So. I would suggest having the honest, authentic conversation um, and see where that takes you. Is that helpful? Thank you very much. Yeah, good. (laughs) Okay, good Um, conversation. Do you want any more or do you want to... There are so many and now people are volunteering for the fishbowl exercise. Yeah, there's one more at the uh, the top. Um, uh, Shall we... Anna, should we we pause? Can we just pause there? Yeah, and and I'll keep writing them down. Is that all right? And I'll pick it up at the end if that's okay. Okay. I love love that people are volunteering for a fishbowl. So I definitely want to come back and do that. That would be amazing. Okay. So um, let's let's now talk about the tangible, practical process of team coaching. And as I said earlier, there are hundreds of iterations and methodologies for how you might do this. But this is the way that I like to do it. Um, And it comes from Hawkins' model. Um, and the training that I had at the AOEC, although I'm not entirely faithful to it, because as I said, as I as I meet a team, um, I tend to use all the different tools that I might have uh, that I think would work really. Um, so for me, there are three key stages in working with a team in a team coaching process, and these stages typically last between six months to a year. So I might see a team for six months to a year, and I might see them on a kind of six weekly monthly basis across that period of time so it's certainly not every week um, it's in blocks of about six weeks um, so the stages are for me I do an inquiry stage to try and work out what's going on I then work with the team to co-diagnose the challenges they're facing and then we work out the work that we want to do together in order to solve those challenges and to move forward so the inquiry stage and I think probably this is some of my most favorite parts of team coaching so I get the brief from the sponsor so the sponsor might be the HRD it might be the chief exec it might be the chairperson of the board um, and I will contract with them around what it is they're looking to achieve so they will give me some kind of perspective about what they think is going on um, and ultimately how they want how they want it to move and normally they talk about performance or they talk about the culture of the team at this stage i'm listening i'm just listening because it's given me cues to what's going on it's helping me to understand what i then do is I, i have a structured interview with every member of the team and a structured a structured interview with some external stakeholders so that 
I'm getting a real sense, I'm having a one-to-one -one conversation about their views of the team. And each interview typically lasts about 45 minutes. Um, and in that interview, I'm asking them things like, uh, tell me about the team at its best. Tell me about the team at its worst. Tell me about the value you feel that you give. Tell me about the value that you feel the team gives. Tell me what the team's missing. Tell me what you think external people think of the team. So I'm trying to get a real understanding. And what I say to people is, this is 100% confidential, right? The only thing that isn't is the thematics that come out collectively. So I, I'm never going to identify you individually in your feedback, but I am going to identify the themes that come out of it. And then alongside this, I run a diagnostic. So there are hundreds of diagnostics that you, you, that you can use that give you a 360 view of the team. Um, probably my favourite, I probably have two favourites. Um, I love the Team Connect 360, which is an AOC tool. Uh, and I love the Culture in the Workplace tool. Um, but there are others. The NHS have a great team effectiveness inventory. There's the Lencioni Dysfunctions Questionnaire, and there are hundreds of others. But I like, I like a diagnostic, really. And, and what I try to do is, dependent on the size of the organisation, get responses from about 30 people um, and those responses come from the team, the team's direct reports, external stakeholder groups, um, the team leader, so that I'm getting a real 360 view of what's going on. I might also, dependent on what the sponsor is telling me is the issue, I might also run something like individual diagnostics on personality types. So I might do 16 PF, I might do an MBTI, I might do some insight stuff, um, or some people posting some lovely tools in the, in the chat. So thank you for that, I shall have a look at those. Um, and then what happens is I go away and I take all this information and I try to solidify it into some key themes. And Typically for me, I'm looking for between three and five key themes that I can explore with the team. Now, Hawk, uh, Hawkins, and I keep mentioning him because I think he's a real um, genius in this area. He describes that as simplexity. So what he says is we're taking some really complicated stuff and we're sieving it down to some broad themes. So we're creating simplexity out of you know something that, that's quite complex really um, and I try and think about it in four areas so I try and think what are what are the challenges that are coming out of this information is it to do with the team's understanding of what they're there for so if we look at the task they've got to do and what outside people expect of them do they have a clear understanding of what they're expected to deliver I then think about inside of the team. So if I think about the job they're doing and I think about what they're like inside of the team, how clear are they on their purpose, their goals and their individual roles? And then I want to think about the processes inside of the team. So I'm then looking at what's going on with their interpersonal dynamics and their culture. Have I got people bickering? You know, are, are there disputes? Are they not communicating? Are they not telling the truth? What, what's going on there? And the last bit is, how are they connecting with their stakeholders? How are they understanding whether they're serving their stakeholders, those people that are outside of their organisation or outside of their team? Um, and I, I try to get between three or five key challenges that come up in those areas. Now, typically what happens is you find that they sit, the challenges for a team will sit in one or two areas. That's my experience. Um, and, and that they really be the key areas that we're focusing on. So what then? So then we go into a diagnosis session with the team. Um, so prepare yourself, come in your best steel armour, because this can be a tricky session. Because what we're doing here is we're going to be exploring with the team what's come out of the diagnostics. And we're going to be asking them to talk about why these things are occurring. So. This is probably the first time that we're inviting them to have absolute psychological safety and real authentic honesty with their team members. And they may never have done this before. And they're about to do it in a public arena with somebody that they don't know very well with them. So 
The first thing that I do is I contract and we contract on the aim of the session, the aims of the work and the way that we're going to work together. So almost a relational contract. What do you expect of me? And what do I expect of you? And how are we going to behave together? I then deliver the key themes and I ask them to explore what's going on. So here is where I assume the coaching position. So I try to hear every voice. I try to reframe blame into challenge. I try to give time out where I think there's been a contract breach or where I'm noticing there are some interesting dynamics going on in the room. And I work in, in the core conditions that, that Rogers outlined in 1957, which is I try to be potent, I try to offer protection and support them, and I try to give them permission to speak. So I'm facilitating and coaching around that honest discussion. And when they've done that, and I would say that probably well, it can take two, three hours to have that conversation, I ask them to describe how they want the team to be in the future. So if we were to jump forward a year, we work together, what does this team look like and what will you be achieving? We then sit down and, and together work out a timeline for how we're going to work on those individual challenges in order to get to that future state. And I say to them, how do you want me to work with you? How do you want me to help you? Which bits of this do you want me to contribute to? So here is an example. I use uh, the fishbone model, um, but again, there are hundreds of different tools that you might use. And actually, this one, that, this one is a school, but I have uh, commercial examples of, that I could give you. But here's what they typically come up with. So they come up with their future state. They come up with their current challenges and they work out the stages that they're going to go through as a team in order to, to kind of move forward in those areas, really. I usually find they find this really empowering. So after you've had that really difficult conversation that feels really painful, it's really nice for them to focus on, on the future. What then? So we, we know what the problem is. We've got a timeline. What happens then is, is we work out across the course of six months or a year how I'm going to use my sessions to co-facilitate, co-create, co-coach the things that they want to achieve. Um, so we always recontract every session. Uh, I'm always coaching and I'm helping them to hold each other to account, not only to the thing that we're doing in the session, but also the things that they've agreed to in previous sessions. And sometimes we might agree that I might work with a smaller number of people in the group if there are specific issues that are getting in the way. So if you've got two people that are loggerheads and it's causing the team not to be able to move forward, we might, in addition to the teamwork, do some paired work with those people in order to help move things forward. All right. So for me, the stages are co-creation, learning from that. And then towards the end of the six months to a year, we're going to be looking at the impact. Now, uh, as uncomfortable as it seems, I, what I often ask teams to do is to, uh, to record a meeting that they have or to allow me to come and watch their meetings. And what that allows me to do is give them feedback on how in real time they're implementing the things that, that we've been talking about over the time that we've been working together. Painful, but invaluable. So I'm going to pause there. Uh, oh, and poor Denise has lost sound. Gosh, yes, I think you can see the recording afterwards, although Anna might have to type that in the chat because I don't think you're going to be able to hear me. Um, should we just yeah. pause there, Anna? A couple of questions. Yeah, I've got questions. Um, so um, I'll type that in the chat for what's the name in a minute. Uh, where do you see team coaching in the next three years? Uh, one question. One part of the question. The second part of the question: Is it likely to be more future-proof than individual coaching? Oh, let me ask. Let me answer the. Um, let me answer the latter question first. I think individual coaching will always have its place because people want to work on their own leadership, their own brand, their own challenges. I just think that team coaching is going to grow in its use um, and popularity, really, as people realise that you need both. You need the individuals to be great, 
but you need the collective team to be great as well. Um, and where do I see it in three years time? What a brilliant question. Um, gosh, I don't know that I know the answer to that. I, where do we see it in three years time? I think for me, I would like to see that we're beginning to see how excellent teams are using that model to really immerse co cultures. So if we're, if we're learning, oh gosh, I'm pausing because Denise can't hear anything. Anna, can I just check in yeah. here? Yeah, I can hear, don't worry, I can hear. Okay. I'm just okay. gonna say to Denise, um, it's probably it's probably going to be Denise's thing. No I, worries. I can okay. hear. No worries, as long as it's not me, that's okay. And everybody else is saying they can hear. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good. I'm yeah. um, so sorry. Three years time. So yes. So for me, it's going to be how team coaching affects wider culture because I think we're really at the beginning of really understanding team team coaching. So when we get really good at that and it becomes an integral part of what organisations and teams do, what we'll see is those people in those teams will use that as a way of behaving in their wider organization. So if you like, the systemic connection of that work be, kind of grows like a national grid network. So I'd like to see we have less dark spaces in terms of team performance and team connection than we've ever had before. Sorry, that was a really wordy answer. <laughs> one more question, Anna. Okay, one more question is, um, uh, when we talk about um, team um do you include the, the team leaders aka management yes <laughs> yes and in fact i've got a great example of that because i think you might be alluding to whether people feel uncomfortable talking in front of that person because maybe they blame that person or there's an issue there so we talk about that stuff um in fact i coached the team recently um uh commercial business um and everybody really behind the chief exec's back was blaming the chief exec so i brought it into the room and i said this is what's going on thematically we need to explore it and the chief exec was in the room and it was a shocking but essential conversation which allowed people to be able to find a way forward and what they realized is they weren't blaming the chief exec, they're just frustrated and they needed to find a way forward. Um, they realised it was a collective response needed, not just one person. So, yeah, good question. Shall I, shall I click on? Is that all right? Yeah, OK. OK, all right, good. So a couple of other bits um, and then we'll round off and I shall let you go off and have your dinner. Um, so a couple of things around ethics and contracting. So, look, this is still coaching, so we have to remember contracting is incredibly important contracting in the way in the ways we're going to work together contracting the outcome so where we intend to be and contracting with different groups of people so how is this going to work with the sponsor with the team and with individuals within the team and i guess don't forget those ethical dilemmas and this is classic coaching stuff as a coach, you have to work with teams that you think you can work with and don't say yes to stuff for money. It's, you know, it's, it seems like a silly thing to say, but you have to really make sure that it's a good fit. Where, where there are process infringements, you have to hold the boundary really carefully. The best example I can give you is that I was working with an organisation and the chair of the board phoned me up and asked me if I could collect evidence as to why they needed to sack the chief exec. Um, I can't, that's not what I'm there for, and, and I need to be clear on that. Any safeguarding or legal issues, the team understanding that you have to report those and saying that out loud at the beginning. Um, any barriers within the group, so if barriers come up, like we can't talk in front of the chief exec, then we need to be able to address that in the room. And it's my job to say when the end is the end. So I can't, I can't ethically keep working with the team if, if the work has been done. So, so my job is to say, I think we've finished now and I might refer you on to someone else who might help you with another aspect of something that you want to do. Um, and I think, um, oh goodness, I've forgotten your name, but the person I was talking to earlier asked a brilliant question about where teams get stuck. So I think I try to keep this in mind because team coaching can be really tough um, emotionally tough, tough for the team, but also for the coach. Um, and it's this piece around Bruce Tuckman's model of change. So don't forget when you're working with a, with a team, there 
their change isn't linear, right? It can't be linear. It has emotions attached to it, stuff happens. So what we see as we start to work with the team is, you know, as Bruce Tuckman describes, they're naive to, to what might be wrong. And when they realize, and they realize they've got to do the hard work, we get into the storming pit, or as I like to call it, excuse my language, the shit pit. Because here, people get grumpy and they don't want to do it and they moan and they behave badly and they're uncomfortable. But we have to go through that in order to norm. And at norming, the team are practicing new ways of being before it all clicks together and we perform highly. So I think as a team coach, we have to remember this model. We have to recognize when those things are happening because otherwise it can feel like when it gets difficult then it might be something that we're doing. Um, and we have to talk to the team about this, that it's going to get uncomfortable, that things are going to be hard. And Brené Brown, she has a great phrase for this. She calls the storming element, the day two blues. There's a lovely podcast that she gives around no matter who you work with in a team capacity, they will hit the day two blues. It will happen. And if it doesn't happen, then you're not working effectively with them. So coming to the end and then I'll do final questions and I'll leave you in peace. Um, but I guess I wanted to finish with why I do this work. Um, and for me, it was something around, I think Paul, I think it might have been Paul who asked a question about, you know, where do I see this in three years time? For me, it's this image here. It's about solving the root of the problem in a greater sphere of influence and impact. So I can work in a one-to-one -one capacity with a person and change their stuff. But when I work with a team, their impact is so much huger. So what I'm changing is a whole system. What they're changing is a whole system. And for me, that's critically important. And I thought I'd finish on this, this lovely quote from Maya Angelou. It's like one of my all time favorites. She says, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think for me, when I think about the stakeholders that we're serving, I think the next generation of, of people in this world deserve teams that are truly excellent and make them feel excellent and help them to achieve excellence. So for me, that's why I go to work every day. And that for me is the difference that I feel team coaching makes. So I'm going to just pause there. I'm going to just put up my contact details because if you've got any questions or you want to get in touch, and as I said at the beginning, I, I love talking to people. So by all means, get in touch and let's have a virtual chat about your thoughts on team coaching. Um, but perhaps we'll do a few final questions and then I shall leave you in peace to have your dinner. Okay. Um so we've got um, a few more. So we've got, um, what would you do if uh, a team is not fit for purpose? Hmm. Hmm. I don't think I have ever met a team that's not fit for purpose. Um, I'm not quite sure if the person that asked that is still there. Maybe they want to, I didn't quite, I didn't write their names down. So, um, Shall I move on to the next question? No, um, I can, I, I can let, me, I I let, me, let me answer that. Oh, it's Sean. Hi, Sean. Sean's just putting something in the chat. Perhaps if you want to give a bit more detail. Maybe if I qualify what I've said, um, I've never met a team that isn't fit for purpose. There are sometimes individuals within the team that aren't right for the team. Um, but usually what happens is in the process of team coaching, they realize that and the team evolves and moves on but teams change all the time and I think that Tuckman curve you know is really important because when people get to the bottom of the pit the, the storming there are two choices the first choice is you get with the program and you move up and you norm with the group in the new ways of being or you get off the bus and really I think the answer to the question is is it's often not the team that isn't fit for purpose. It might be individuals within the team, but you go through the process of, of helping people to realize where they are and then they have choice. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Um, and Sean has added, I don't know if he's added on to that saying, if the structure and functioning of the team is not right for the specified outcomes, I think that's what he was trying to clarify. Yeah, then the, um, that normally comes up in the diagnostic. So um, we would have a direct conversation about that and then the team would work to solve that. 
Now, if that's a restructuring problem, then actually what the team would normally do is they would indicate that that is out of their remit. And so then the leaders would take that on. And that's where you might work separately with that element of the leadership team to think about that restructure. And we might have to do that piece of work first before we then come back to the wider new team in order to move things on. So I think that's a really good question. Okay, and um, next question is, do you find it hard to transform a group into a team? I find it hard. I think team coaching is really hard, if I'm entirely honest. Um, it's emotionally hard and it's, um, oh, but I love it. I, I, I think there's something really, it's a really special thing to be able to work with a team and have really honest conversations about their dynamics. Where else in your world does that happen? I mean, in the UK, we're really bad at being honest. We just we don't we don't speak we speak in like we speak in um i can't think of the word metaphors and and implication we we don't often speak in a direct way so it's a really special thing to be invited into a team and speak honestly with them and to help them to speak honestly so i love it it can be difficult but i love it okay and thought and sean thanks you for your answers that's a great answer sean said and then um, next question is, I've got a couple more questions. That'd be all right for you, Catherine. That's fine, yeah. 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 How, um, how long does individual, oh, how long does individual coaching take? Hmm. I don't know, um, yeah, it's about individual coaching. That's all right, I can answer that. So into, uh, it depends on, on who you work with, but when I'm individually coaching people, um, I generally work with people for two hours um and normally six weeks apart um and i see people for a minimum of six sessions because for me that's that's the length of time minimum length of time for impact that's my personal coaching preference and experience but every coach is different and you have to find a coach that works for you okay um now this question is about, i think that Sorry to, to call your name out, uh, Jeanette, but I wasn't, there's a word that I wasn't quite sure. So I'll, I'll say it how she's asked it and maybe, maybe it's another way. How do you phrase team coaching or team building so they do not flinch? I don't know whether she meant clash, but she's put flinch. I don't know. Um, she said, I have had teams say, why, what's wrong with us? Oh, does that make means, sense no, to you? She, yeah, she means flinch. She yeah. means flinch, yeah. Um, okay, so I always start the co-diagnosis session by saying I've been brought here because my understanding is that for one or all of you, there are some challenges that, are, that this team are facing and I'm here to work with you around the solutions to those challenges. So I'm going to start by talking about what I've noticed and then I'm going to invite you to talk. So that question of have we done something wrong or is there something wrong with us doesn't really come up, but they definitely are uncomfortable at the beginning. And it takes, it takes time to get them to trust you and to be honest. So I have to push a lot on making sure I ask everyone to speak. So I often say, I don't know, Claire, I haven't heard your voice you know, it's important to hear your voice. Can you talk about what you think about this? So sometimes you just have to keep pushing on those dynamics. So yeah, flinch, I can appreciate what you're saying, definitely. Yeah, I get it now when I, once, I, <laughs> once I heard your answer. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, a couple more questions, if that's okay. Of um, some of these are, Arthur, what kind of uh, safeguarding issues come up in teams uh, if, if if any, can you give an, an example? Um, yes, although I don't think I've ever had a safeguard. I've had safeguarding issues come up in one-to-one -one coaching, but never really in a team context because we're talking about the team functioning. Um, having said that, red flags for me would be eh, probably anything around mental health. If I think that there are, you know, if I think someone's vulnerable within the group, um, if I think someone's being bullied, if I think, you know, and I, 
you have to be careful about that stuff. So I can say what's going on here, but, it, but I think if it continues, then I have a responsibility to make sure that people are safe. Um, so what I do there is I say to, to the team, I'm noticing this and this is what I'm going to need to do about it. Can we talk about how I manage that? So I always make sure I have the conversation first with them before I go and do anything. Probably mental health safeguarding in that sense would be the key one for me. Okay, thanks. And uh, the final question I've got here is, what would you say are the key attributes for a great coach? Hmm. You might be able to tell me the answer to that as a group more than I could tell you the answer to that. Um, because I think recipients have a, have a better idea of that. But yeah. um, for me, probably my top three things would be curious, so ask the questions, potent, and by potent I mean don't be afraid to say the thing you're seeing. And I think probably the last one is compassion is the wrong word. I think protective so there has to be a nice balance between challenge and honesty but also support and care so i am in your corner and i'm here to be with you um but i'm also here to be challenging so i think it's it's that nice balance always be curious and that i've just noticed jeremy's put in the chat look at the um, association for coaching the icc ICF or the EMCC competencies as a guide. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a nice question. Nice answer. Yeah. And, and lots of people are put in here. Thanks for the presentation and sharing your practice, Catherine. Absolute brilliant presentation. Very useful, brilliant answers. And that's been a theme running all the way through um, uh, from the chat that, you know, they've been really pleased. It's been a really fabulous um, mm -hmm. presentations and you've given some really good um, solutions and some good answers. So great feedback. Um, truly outstanding. Oh, truly outstanding presentation, Catherine. Oh, wow. I'm going to take one that. Of, somebody put one <laughs> of the best presentations I've, um, I've been to. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate um, your presentation. Brilliant, Catherine. Uh, great thought provoking. Some wonderful stuff here, Catherine. Um, super oh. presentation, great insights. You're making me cringe now, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, you made my Thursday night. Thank you. It's always a joy to be at CIPD. And I yeah. genuinely, you know, happy to come back and do a team coaching fishbowl if we can find some willing recipients. Why not? Well, we've had quite a few people that volunteered themselves. So what we would do, we'll probably put it out there and we'll, we'll because there's quite a few people saying they'd like to do it, maybe we'll put it out there for our, on our next um, events um, for the coming future. Um, before we finish off, so thank you very much, Catherine. Um, we're going to, we're looking at um, for our last uh, events for uh, this year. That's, uh, that's going to be coming up for the South East London branch. Uh, one's going to be on the 9th of, um, June, which is mindfulness and yoga. And, um, and then the, the last one will be um, uh, end of year summer social, um, which will be on the 10th of uh, June. And the summer social will be delivering our business plan or we're giving the results of our business plan of about the events that's the coming events for the next year. And um, also looking, sharing with our, our members, our values and our vision and our mission for what we want to do for the, the coming year, um, uh, 21, 22. So uh, really thank you all very much for coming to tonight's presentation. I look forward to seeing you uh, at those two last events on the 9th of June and the 10th of June. I will be doing the mindfulness yoga, well it's not a presentation, it'll be a practical session. So if anybody's into practical mindfulness and yoga, you, I'll be there on the, the, the 9th delivering that and or otherwise I'll see you all on the 10th if you want to do that and there's still some people you've got some real fans here uh, writing an excellent presentation uh, wonderful really interesting and there's lots of people wanting to volunteer um, so it'll be good to capture um, those volunteers for us to then uh, because then you'd need you'd need to know the volunteers wouldn't you so you're at to for you to be able to put it together. Yeah, um, we, 
we'd need to do some pre-prep definitely i'm trying to think how we'd get uh people to i suppose they could write in um email in to monica um to say that they would like to volunteer for the fishbowl um yeah but there's some lots of people putting forward themselves as volunteer so um thank you once again overwhelmingly wonderful um uh presentation there and some really thought-provoking interesting stuff about do you know i i never even thought about um team coaching as a thing i always just thought about individual but it makes a lot of sense to to me tonight what you said um that you know individual may talk about their own individual things that's happening with them but the, the, from the team you'd hear from the team the whole overarching things that's creating uh maybe problems to stop the team from going forward so really lovely stuff so thank you for that and um yeah so everybody thank you so much